Welcome, true crime enthusiasts and curious minds alike. There's no denying the chilling allure of true crime, a world where the darkest corners of human nature are laid bare for all to see. The fascination deepens when these heinous acts are orchestrated not by lone wolves, but by charismatic leaders who wield control over their devoted followers. Leaders such as Charles Manson. In the late 1960s, Manson, a failed musician with a criminal past, emerged from the shadows of society and into infamy. His name is synonymous with a reign of terror that shook America to its core. But what is often overlooked is the role played by his followers, particularly the women who would come to be known as Manson's girls. These young women, drawn into Manson's web of manipulation and control, would become key players in a series of crimes that continue to haunt the collective memory. As we delve into this dark chapter of true crime, we seek to understand who were these women, why did they follow Manson, and most importantly, what led them down this terrifying path of destruction. Join us as we tell the story of Charles Manson's radical female followers. Charles Manson was born in 1934 to a teenage mother with a criminal past. His early life was marked by neglect, abuse, and a revolving door of correctional facilities. As an adult, Manson spent more than half his life in prison for various petty crimes. However, it was during one of these stints behind bars that he reportedly became fascinated with Scientology and the pop culture of the time, particularly the music of the Beatles. Upon his release in 1967, Manson moved to San Francisco, just as the city was becoming the epicenter of the counterculture movement. He began to attract a following, primarily of young, impressionable women. Manson's charisma and his promise of a utopian society built on love and freedom resonated deeply with these lost souls who were often struggling with their own personal traumas. Manson's ideology was a unique and distorted blend of pop culture, spirituality, and his own twisted interpretations. He was particularly influenced by the Beatles' song, Helter Skelter, which he believed contained coded messages predicting an impending racial war. Manson convinced his followers that they would be the chosen ones to survive this apocalyptic event, emerging afterward to rule the world. This narrative, combined with a potent mix of drugs, sexual manipulation, and psychological control, allowed Manson to transform these young women into devoted followers. They saw him not just as a leader, but as a messiah. In their eyes, Charles Manson could do no wrong, and they were willing to go to any lengths to prove their loyalty to him, even if it meant committing unspeakable acts of violence. Charles Manson had a keen eye for vulnerability. He sought out young women, often with troubled pasts, who were searching for a sense of belonging. Manson presented himself as a father figure, offering these lost souls a home and a community. But beneath this facade of love and acceptance lay a sinister reality. Manson manipulated these women, exploiting their emotional instability and their longing for acceptance to draw them into his web of control. The ranch where they lived served as home to Manson and his followers from mid-1968 until their arrest in 1969, became the stage on which Manson orchestrated his reign of psychological terror. Here he employed various abusive tactics to ensure their loyalty. Manson, like all cult leaders, ensured that his followers saw him as an all-powerful messiah-like figure. He controlled every aspect of their lives, dictating what they ate, when they slept, and how they thought. Under the influence of copious amounts of drugs provided by Manson, these women were gradually stripped of their free will, their identities subsumed by Manson's apocalyptic vision. Sexual manipulation was another tool in Manson's arsenal. Manson used sex not just to control his followers, but also to bind them to him. It was part of a calculated strategy to break down their sense of self, leaving them more susceptible to his influence. The tragic result of this manipulation and control was a group of young women who were not only fiercely loyal to Manson, but also willing to do his bidding, no matter how horrifying. 
Manson exerted over these women is evident in their willing participation in such horrific acts. Despite the brutality of their crimes, they remained loyal to Manson, testifying on his behalf during the trial and maintaining you, their devotion uh, even say, after their convictions. And was it your idea or, or Charlie's idea? <laughs> huh? My very own idea. Yeah. And, uh, Linda's, a, Linda's a friend of mine. I know that. And um, she, hasn't, she hasn't been able to see anybody for a long, long, long time. She's been programmed and programmed and programmed with negative programming mm -hmm. to where she's, she's frightened. She wants her children back. It, whatever, whatever she has to do to get her children back, she's doing it, mm -hmm. whether it's true or untrue. Yeah. And um, I can see where she'd, she would do anything to get out of jail and to get her kids back. Mm -hmm. But she's taking a lot of peace. She's um, putting a lot of people in jeopardy at the same time. Linda Kasabian. Born as Linda Druin on June 21, 1949, in Biddeford, Maine, Kasabian had a tumultuous childhood, with her parents divorcing and remarrying while she was still young. At the age of 20, Kasabian found herself at the Spahn Ranch, the infamous base of operations for the Manson family. She was introduced to Manson by a friend, and despite only knowing him for a matter of days, she was quickly drawn into his web of manipulation and control. Kasabian is best known for her role as the getaway driver in the notorious Tate murders. Despite her involvement, she did not actively participate in the killings. This, coupled with her subsequent cooperation with law enforcement, led to her being granted immunity in exchange for her testimony against Manson and the other family members. After the trial, Kasabian attempted to return to a normal life. She lived in New Hampshire and later in Washington State, raising four children. However, her past continued to follow her, resulting in occasional run-ins with the law. Kasabian passed away on January 21, 2023. Despite her early association with the Manson family, she is remembered by many as the woman who helped put Charles Manson behind bars. Patricia Krenwinkel, one of the most notorious members of the Manson family, was Patricia Krenwinkel. Born in Los Angeles in 1947 to an insurance salesman father and a homemaker mother, Patricia's early life was seemingly unremarkable. But beneath the surface, she struggled with deep insecurities and a longing for acceptance. Krenwinkel first met Charles Manson in 1967 at a party in Manhattan Beach, California. Enamored by his charisma and promises of love and acceptance, she left her life behind to join him and his growing family on their communal ranch. In the Manson family, Patricia, often known as Katie, found the sense of belonging she had always craved. But this came at a heavy price. Like the other followers, she fell under Manson's spell, succumbing to his manipulative tactics and twisted ideology. Krenwinkel played a chilling role in the infamous Manson family crimes. She was directly involved in the Tate-LaBianca murders, showing a level of brutality that shocked even seasoned investigators. Her loyalty to Manson was so deep that it overrode any sense of morality or compassion. Post-Manson, Patricia's life took a dramatic turn. Convicted of her involvement in the murders, she became the longest-serving female inmate in California's history. Behind bars, she sought to make amends for her past actions. She received a bachelor's degree in human services from the University of La Verna and became active in prison programs, including the canine support team. Leslie Van Houten Born on August 23, 1949, in Los Angeles, California, Van Houten came from a middle-class, church-going family. Despite her seemingly normal upbringing, she fell into substance abuse at a young age, creating a rift in her relationship with her mother. In late 1968, Van Houten's life took a dark turn when she met Charles Manson and his family. Drawn in by Manson's charisma and the allure of a community where she felt accepted, Van Houten quickly became a devoted follower. As a member of the Manson family, Van Houten played a significant role in the brutal 1969 slayings of Leno and Rosemary LaBianca. 
Her involvement in these crimes demonstrated the depth of her loyalty to Manson and the extent of his control over her. Following her arrest and conviction, Van Houten spent over half a century in prison. During this time, she sought to distance herself from her past actions, earning her bachelor's degree and working within prison programs to help others. Following 53 years in custody, Van Houten was released on parole July 11, 2023, and will participate in a transitional housing program to help her with employment training, teach her how to get a job, and support herself. Susan Atkins, also known as Sadie Mae Glutz. Born on May 7, 1948, Atkins had a troubled upbringing. After her mother's death from cancer and her father's abandonment, she was left to fend for herself at a young age. Atkins first met Charles Manson at a commune in San Francisco in 1967. Captivated by his music and charisma, she quickly became one of his most devoted followers. Atkins' life took a sinister turn as she was drawn deeper into the Manson family's web of manipulation and control. Atkins played a significant role in the infamous Tate murders orchestrated by Manson in 1969. She was convicted for her direct involvement in these heinous crimes, which included the murder of pregnant actress Sharon Tate. Following her conviction, Atkins spent the remainder of her life in prison. Despite attempts to gain parole, her involvement in the Manson family crimes ensured that she remained behind bars until her death in 2009 due to brain cancer. Mary Bruner, the woman who holds the dubious distinction of being Manson's first recruit. Born on December 17th, 1943, in Wisconsin, Brunner was an assistant librarian at UC Berkeley when she met Charles Manson in 1967. With her bachelor's degree in history and a steady job, she seemed an unlikely candidate for Manson's dark path. Their meeting marked a turning point in Brunner's life. Falling under Manson's spell, she left her job and joined him in his nomadic lifestyle. Brunner not only became a devoted follower, but also bore Manson a son further entangling her life with his. Bruner's involvement in the crimes associated with the Manson family is significant. Bruner was present during the murder of Gary Hinman in 1969, a crime that prefaced the infamous Tate LaBianca murders. Following her arrest, Bruner spent several years in prison before being paroled in 1977. After her release, she disappeared from the public eye, living a life of relative obscurity. Lynette Alice Squeaky Fromm Born on December 22, 1948, in Santa Monica, California, Fromm grew up in Westchester where her father worked as an aeronautical engineer. Fromm met Manson in Venice Beach, California, in 1967. At the time, she was homeless and directionless, making her an easy target for Manson's manipulative charm. She soon became a devoted member of the Manson family, and earned her nickname Squeaky due to the sound she made when Manson pinched her cheek. While Froma was not directly involved in the infamous murders, her loyalty to Manson was unswerving. She became his voice when he was sent to prison, maintaining her allegiance to the man who had so drastically altered her life. Perhaps the most notorious event in Froma's life came after Manson's imprisonment, when she attempted to assassinate the 38th President of the United States. Gerald Ford, in 1975. This act resulted in a life sentence for Fromm. After serving nearly 34 years in prison, Fromm was released on parole in 2009. She has largely stayed out of the public eye since then, living a life far removed from the chaos and violence that marked her younger years. Catherine Louise, Gypsy Cher, another fascinating figure entwined in the Manson family narrative. Born on December 10, 1942, in Paris, France, Cher had a challenging early life. Her Hungarian father and German mother were both members of the French underground during World War II. Orphaned at a young age, she was adopted by an American couple and moved to the United States. A talented pianist and singer, Cher initially sought a career in the arts. However, her path took a dark turn when she met Charles Manson. She was quickly drawn into his circle and became known as Gypsy, a moniker that became synonymous with her identity within the Manson family. While Cher wasn't directly involved in the notorious Tate-LaBianca murders, 
her association with the Manson family led to legal troubles. She was convicted of armed robbery, a crime committed under Manson's influence. This conviction marked a turning point in her life, leading to her incarceration. After serving her sentence, Cher distanced herself from the Manson family and their crimes. She has since turned her life around, dedicating herself to helping others avoid the pitfalls of cult involvement. In the complex narrative of Charles Manson's female followers, Sandra Collins Good, also known as Blue, holds a unique place. Born on February the 20th, 1944, Good's upbringing was far removed from the violent path she would later tread. She was the daughter of a stockbroker, and the divorce of her parents marked a turning point in her life. Good crossed paths with Charles Manson in 1968, quickly falling under his spell and becoming a member of the infamous Manson family. Her unwavering loyalty earned her the nickname Blue, a moniker that stuck with her throughout her association with the family. Unlike some of Manson's followers, Good was not directly involved in the notorious murders. However, in 1975, Good was sentenced to 15 years for sending death threats, demonstrating the depth of her allegiance to Manson and his warped ideologies. After serving her sentence, Good's devotion to Manson remained steadfast. She continued to believe that Manson and the family had changed the course of her life in a positive way. Despite the criminal history and the social ostracization, Good remained a staunch supporter of Manson, underscoring the lasting impact of his manipulation. Barbara Hoyt Born on December 27, 1951, in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, Hoyt's journey into the Manson family was as tumultuous as it was tragic. Hoyt joined the Manson family in April of 1969, during a time when the group was living at Spawn's Ranch. Her initiation into the family was not unusual for the time, with Manson's charismatic persona and countercultural rhetoric drawing in many lost souls seeking purpose and belonging. Hoyt was not directly involved in the notorious Tate LaBianca murders. However, she was present at Spahn's ranch on the night of the crimes and was later shocked to learn of her family members' horrific actions. After the murders, Hoyt became a critical witness for the prosecution, her testimony playing a significant role in the conviction of the Manson family members involved in the killings. Despite threats and intimidation from the Manson family, she remained steadfast, committed to ensuring justice was served. Following her involvement with the Manson family, Hoyt managed to extricate herself from the toxic environment and pursued a career in nursing. Her life after Manson was marked by resilience and recovery, but it was not without challenges. The Manson family continued to harass and intimidate her, making it difficult for her to move on. Barbara Hoyt passed away on December 3, 2017, at the age of 66 due to kidney failure. As we conclude this exploration into the lives of Charles Manson's female followers, it's crucial to take a moment and reflect on these twisted narratives. These women, who started with ordinary lives like many of us, were drawn into a web of manipulation, control, and ultimately, horrific violence. If you found this video insightful, please like, share, and subscribe to our channel for more into history's most intriguing true crime stories. And remember, history isn't just about the past. It's a guide, a warning, and a lesson for the present and the future. Always remember to stay safe, stay aware, and never forget the victims and their families who bear the real cost of these horrific crimes. Until next time, this is Twisted Narratives, signing off.